YouTube. I'll tell you why in a few moments. I'm Dr. Sherman. Where am I? 308. My office is in the office block right over there. Go in, take a left, take a right, take a right. Sit in the back corner. Peck call 352. Um, email ted.sherman at mtsu.edu. Uh, use this email. Don't use the D2L for the simple reason I check this regularly. I check D2L once a day. Uh, if I'm not in my office, which I'm not usually, I usually do mo most of my work from home. Um, sad to say, but I'm connected, you know, 16 hours a day. And I will check this probably every 30 minutes. Okay. Uh, if you haven't heard, if you haven't gotten a response back to me, email like within 24 hours, I'm dead. Or <laughs> something is happening. Usually you'll get an email, you'll get a response within an hour. I, I'm very, uh, I know a lot of professors aren't like that, but, you know, if you've taken the time to email me, I'll respond pretty quickly, okay? Um, notice there's no phone number, because I don't answer my phone if I'm in my office. Like, during office hours, I don't answer the phone, okay? Uh, for the simple reason, I get too much spam. People are trying to sell me something, mutual funds, retirement, whatever. Uh, so I, I literally haven't answered my phone in probably 10 years. Okay. It sits there, it gets messages, after a while they just disappear. I get an email if the phone rings. Uh, if there's a voice message, I can click on it. Usually there aren't any voice messages. It'll just show me the number, which tells me if there's no voice message, it's spam. Okay? Um, so don't bother calling. Office hours. I put 7.30. I'll be here by 7. I know it's kind of early. Um... But I'll be here by 7, so 7 to 9 a.m. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, roughly 7 to 8 a.m. Tuesday, Thursday. Um, I can stick around after class, after this class, because I don't have class after it. Um, and by appointment, I can come up Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. I'll be here some Wednesdays anyways, because departmental meetings at 1130. Um, so email me, we can work a time to get together. Courses, Renunciation of Power in the Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter. Hold on a second. I'm going to go back to content. Does the font bother you that much? Yeah, it really does. I, I hate no, no. There it is. You may not have to double blame you. Hopefully, this one. It's a little better. Um, it's all scratched up, though, but whatever. <laughs> Um, so, Renunciation of Power, The Lord of the Rings, and Harry Potter. So, the texts are the seven Harry Potter novels. Um, if, if you want to, you know, do Pottermore and uh, Fantastic Beasts and where to find them and all that kind of stuff, have at it. We won't talk about that at all, okay? And then The Lord of the Rings. And I did not bring a copy with me because I forgot. Um, but I generally use and generally assign the one volume 50th anniversary edition. So in class, that's the one I will use. In yep, looks just like that one. And I will refer to that one in class. Why is that important? Page numbers. So I'll say turn to page. And if you've got an individual volume of the Fellowship of the Ring, your pagination will be different. Same for... Uh, two Towers, Return of the King, um, and such. Okay? Notice for both of these, they're books, not films. <laughs> okay? Do not assume you can pass this class without reading the books by watching the films. For the simple reason, you can't. Why? Directors take poetic license with texts when they adapt them to film. Um, so, and we won't, I was going to say we won't talk about the films, but we will a little. <clears throat> Usually, I'll be uh, dumping on them, because I hate them. Um, <laughs> I will make some positive comments. There are, there are a couple of, epi couple of scenes in The Lord of the Rings. Peter Jackson did fantastically. The rest of it was horrible. Um, and the Harry Potter stuff, kind of the same, okay? Um, I also have, and I have not... Did 
I put it up? Oh, no, I haven't put it up yet. Um, I've got this essay, ready to go, by Tolkien on fairy stories, uh, which I have not put the link up, I don't think, yet to, the, to that, um, that I'll put up after class today, that I'd like you to read, but you won't be, there won't be a quiz over it, you won't have an exam over it, uh, but I'll make a lot of references to this thing as we go. In fact, it's most of what I'll talk about today. Okay? Um, I didn't think I'd keep you the whole time, but I won't shut up, so I'll keep you here the whole time. Um, and then, I don't know why I put this up. Probably because I was copying and pasting from one syllabus to another. The Purdue Online Writing, that just gives you, um, that particular link gives you information about MLA formatting style. Why? You're going to write two essays in here. They're both exams. One is over Lord of the Rings. One is over the Harry Potter novels. Okay? And then there will be a bunch of quizzes. Right? Okay? And you need to use MLA style for both those essays. We'll talk about that um, later. Okay? So, course description. Notice, you know, the course has a title. The Renunciation of Power in the Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter should say in the Harry Potter novels, okay? So, specific theme of the course is the renunciation of power in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and Rowling's Harry Potter novels. So what does that mean? The course examines the ways in which each author focuses on the uses and abuses of power and ultimately how each author suggests humility, restraint, and sacrifice, or the renunciation of power, as the means to resist and defeat Arrogance, ambition, and the will to power. Okay? Anybody know why I have the will to power in quotation marks? It's a very famous phrase. It comes from a 19th century German philosopher named Friedrich Nietzsche. And it really animated people like Hitler. Okay? You're going to see a lot of very... Hitler-esque ideas, for example, in not Lord of the Rings, the Harry Potter novels. In fact, we kind of have a, a Hitler stand-in, almost of sorts, um, Voldemort. And Voldemort's, uh, what do we want to call him? Ideological godfather, Grindelwald. Okay. Who's Grindelwald, anybody? What did, what did Dumbledore do? He dueled him. He was his best friend, we find out late. When did he duel him? Anybody know? 1945. That's when Grindelwald was defeated. Yeah, coincidence. You know what happened in our, you know, there's all kinds of things like that. Okay? At, at various courses, at various times this semester, some of you, you're going to sit there and you're going to have to hold on to your head because it's just going to want to explode. Because you're going to go, oh my God, I never thought of that kind of thing. Okay, so I stole the title, essentially, yeah, modified it, from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis wrote one of the early first reviews of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, and he titled his review, The Dethronement of Power. Okay, now in the fairy story essay, Tolkien talks about power. But he doesn't talk about power as, you know, Fairies tramping around in the woods, you know, throwing power here and there. He talks about power and its effect on others. And he distinguishes between two kinds of power. He distinguishes between the power of the magician and the power of the, what he calls, sub-creator. Okay? And the magician, he says, is, you know, uses power or has power to dominate wills and things. That is, to exert power, dominance over wills and things. How many of you have read the Harry Potter novels? Show of hands. Most of you, okay? How many of you have seen some of the Harry Potter films? Most of you, okay? okay? So, we find out in the fourth book in the Harry Potter series. See, I shouldn't even be going there. I should be finishing this all this, but what the hell. Um, there are three unforgivable curses. What are they? Imperio, what's, in, what's the Imperius curse do? It controls somebody. There's the domination of will. What else? First novel, 
Harry and Ron's and Hermione's, one of their early classes with Professor Flitwick. What do we see that Hermione can do that Ron can't? Wingardium Leviosa. She exerts power on a feather. She makes it float. Okay? That's power. Tolkien says that's the power of the magician. Okay? Which, as he will say in the fairy story, I say, that's bad. That's bad power. Bad juju. You know? But the power that the sub-creator has, the author, the painter, the composer, etc., that's different. We'll talk about that later. So it's the renunciation of power. Jump to the end of the Lord of the Rings. Does Frodo renounce power? To take that back. Not the very end. On Mount Doom. Does he renounce power? Does he get there and go, I want to get rid of this damn ring because it's eating me apart. No. He says, the ring is mine. I will not do what I came to do. I claim it. Frodo fails at that moment. Total failure. Total. Not a little bit positive. Total, absolute failure. Why? Because Gandalf tells us early in the beginning of the novel why that's going to happen. Tolkien's, Tolkien gives us all kinds of foreshadow. Okay? Where do we see that? Who else tries to wear the ring earlier? Sam does. And Sam willingly takes it off and gives it back to Frodo. Now, Frodo does renounce power at other points. Don't get me wrong. He's not a total moral failure in terms of the overall um, arc of the story. Okay? So we'll talk about that. Uh, disclaimer. Syllabus is subject to revision. Why? I talk too much. I mean, it's pretty much it. Um, so all changes will be made in class, and they'll be posted on D2L. Okay? If you miss class, don't email me and go, did we miss anything? Because it will be posted on D2L. Okay? Plus, every class is recorded, and it gets put on YouTube. So if you miss a class, I'll send you the link. You can then look up the class that you missed, and you can watch it. Okay? I do that for a couple of reasons. I began doing that several years ago for people who missed class. They could then, you know, watch what they missed, etc. And over the last couple of years, I've done it for that reason. And it's also a form of self-protection. Why? Everything I say is recorded and put online. Not snippets. Right? Because some of you might disagree with something I say, and you might record it, and a blip might get recorded. And I can just say, go look at the full thing, because it's all there. Okay? And I'll be honest with you. I'm opinionated, and you'll hear my opinions about a wide variety of stuff. Okay? Yeah, the course is about Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter. But what are the Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter about? Is the Lord of the Rings solely about Middle Earth? No. <laughs> is Harry Potter solely about some kid who discovers on his 11th birthday that he's magical, and he's a wizard, and there's a dark wizard out to get him? No. How do you know? Because J.K. Rowling throws throws the word in second novel, I believe it is Mudblood. What's Mudblood? What is a modern American equivalent? Nobody will want to use the word. It's a nigger. I actually, I read my reviews, my evaluations from last fall, and one student said, he used the N-word and I didn't think it was appropriate. Well, stop it. Who, why are you calling me? Go away. <laughs> That's exactly what Rowling wants you to understand. Why? She doesn't invent this word. This word was used in the early 20th century by the KKK to describe African Americans. They rose from the mud. That's the mentality. Okay? So, all about wizards and witches off doing stuff and gallivanting and, you know, griffins. No. Right? When we talk about the fairy story, I say, you'll see what 
Tolkien says, fairy stories, and by that he means fantasy literature, what they are really about. Okay? So changes will be made, or if they're made, they'll be made in class, posted on D2L, and then everything will be on YouTube. Students with disabilities, you know who you are, you know what you need to do, and I probably should have already received the paperwork from that office, but I haven't got anything, so I don't think that applies. Cell phones, laptops, tablets. I hate to do this, but after last fall, <laughs> I've had it. Um, don't. Don't use cell phones. Don't use laptops. Don't, don't use tablets. Okay? Let's talk about cell phones first. Um, use of cell phones for calls, texting, selfies, etc. is prohibited. Two years ago, classroom over there, uh, 311, I had somebody sitting like where that gentleman is in the back corner. And I'm not kidding, for the first month of classes, this young lady every day for the first half hour of class did nothing but sat there and took selfies. And she would do it just like that. This direction, this direction, this. Look at the background, folks. It's the same. It doesn't change. Right? And I finally said, Jordan, stop. And midway in the semester, she just disappeared. You know, and stopped coming at all. Right? Now, there is a reason, there are some reasons, that you can have your cell phones out. Okay? If you're a first responder, EMT, fire police, etc., okay, let me know soon, like today, <laughs> next day of class. Okay? And, and if, you, if you're on call or something like that, have your phone out, put it on silent. If you get up and leave, I'll know why. Okay? Similarly, and this one's pretty important. Because it happens literally every semester. I don't know if it's if I just draw the people who are going to have you know the universe crap on them or what. But if you have an ongoing family emergency or situation, or something happens in the course of the semester where an emergency arises, let me know immediately. Email me that day. That is. Take care of the urgency, the, the emergency, immediately. Don't stop to email me while somebody's having a heart attack. Get them to the hospital first, and then while you're in the waiting room, short email. Okay? But let me know as soon as it happens, within a day. And I will do everything in my power to make sure that, one, you can complete the course, and two, you can complete the course by passing it. Because you can complete the course with an F. Believe me, many students don't think they can, but they work at it, and they, they do achieve that F, okay? Um, if you have that kind of situation, I will say, keep your phone out, keep it on silent, and if you get up and leave, I will understand, and I will know why, and you do not have to say anything, okay? If, however, I had, I had this happen last fall, it was like the second or third night of class, it was a night course. And a student had told me, you know, her dad was ill, et cetera. And literally, the second or third night of class, five minutes into class, she takes her phone, goes outside, and I just start to hear bawling. She starts to come in. I go out to meet her. Her dad died. Okay? So I and another student, you know, kind of helped her. He got all her stuff, took her down to where somebody was going to pick her up, et cetera. So... Again, I'll do everything I can. I had another student who had um, uh, crowd issues. She was going through all kinds of stress, but being in a class like this just freaked her out to no end. She passed the class, but she never came. She did everything online, essentially. Right? Doesn't mean everybody can do that. You got to. I mean, there's got to be a good reason. I've got to, you know. C cause, so to speak. Okay? Um, what you don't want to do is have something happen, as I had happen last fall. Uh, have something happen, let's say, the first week of February. And you wait until literally April 28th, the last day of class. And send me an email and say, I should have contacted you earlier. <laughs> but, because I'll say... 
but I'm sorry. <laughs> it's too late now. Yes, you should have contacted me earlier, right? That doesn't happen very often. Usually when something like that happens, there will be a string of professors' names in the email, and it's somebody requesting a W because they're withdrawing from the university, right? Um, so let me know, and I'll do everything I can to help you. Now the thing about laptops and tablets. I used to allow laptops and tablets. I'm for a course like this. You can read Harry Potter. You can read Lord of the Rings all via PDF, Kindle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can get them free as well as you know the paid ones. Um, but last semester in this classroom, uh, night class is literally like these two rows. People had books. They, you know, were taking notes. In those two rows on both sides, everybody had a laptop out. And everybody throughout the class was sitting there typing. Well, they weren't taking notes from me. How did I know? Because two or three of them had a biology textbook, an aviation textbook, and something else. Right? So I'm done with it. I've been teaching here 20 years. I'm just done. Okay? Um, and I could show you if you wanted to. I could show you, I could send you links to about a half dozen different studies that are pretty conclusive. You take notes by hand, you retain it much, much more than when you do this. Because when you do this, you're trying to be a recorder. You do this, your mind is filtering out the nonsense. Which there won't be any in here, but you know. Um, okay, classroom decorum and all that kind of stuff. Decorum just means proper behavior. Okay? So, come to class on time. If you know you're going to be late every day, let me know. Like, you know, if you're coming, you get off, what time is it? 9.40. You get off work at 9 o'clock in Nashville. You're probably going to be a little late because you might drive fast and you might get here in 20 minutes. It is possible. Um, <laughs> but you might then spend an hour looking for a parking spot. Okay? I wouldn't suggest doing that. Uh, a couple years ago, we did have a student kill another student over a parking spot. Mm -hmm. Literally, pulled out a knife and because she took her spot. Okay, so be aware. Some of your neighbors might be a little crazy. She's doing life. Um, so arrive to class on time. Be quiet. Pay attention. If I'm talking, somebody else is talking. That doesn't mean you have to sit there like corpses. Um, be nice to each other. That's what courteous means. Uh, use language appropriate to the setting. I'll try not to swear too much. I will. There will be damned and hells every now and then. Um, don't eat during class. I don't care if you eat. But don't come in with a big old bag of crunchy Cheetos or Doritos so that the person next to you, you know, starts wigging out because of the crunching sounds in their ears. Or chewing like, you know, a handful of gum where you can't even close your mouth properly. Just be courteous of the people around you, okay? Um, what else? Don't fall asleep. Why? Because if you do, I'm going to do this. Don't, you know. <laughs> It'll be the last time you fall asleep in my class, okay? Um, I've, and usually that's really helpful if somebody has their head flat down on the desk. <laughs> I've only had to do that, I think, about three times. Um, but it gets the point across. Um, what else? Uh, don't do homework or assignments for other classes. <laughs> or if you're going to, be smart about it. Don't come in with that big, massive nursing textbook and have it right in front of you. Here, sit in the back so I can't see you. <laughs> I mean, some people, wow. Um, what else? Headphones, earbuds, again, wow. I've had students walk into this classroom, sit in that back corner, and I can hear the music <laughs> while I am talking. Now, I've got a pretty loud voice. That's why I close the door. I've had teachers and secretaries, not on this hallway, on the side hallways, tell me they've heard me. It's like, well, good, somebody does. <laughs> um, so take your headphones, earbuds out. Headphones, the great big ear. I've literally had students wear them and I'm like, Joshua, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. um, 
What? Come prepared to participate? Okay, I'm going to take this sentence off. Okay, why? Because I'm not going to be your book monitor. You guys are all adults. You're paying for this. I'm not. <laughs> if you want to fail, have at it. Fail spectacularly. Do something wonderfully. Okay, or succeed. <laughs> Whichever. It's up to you. Okay, um, but I'll warn you, it'll be hard. Not necessarily to pass. It'll be difficult to pass if you don't bring a book and take notes. It'll be hard to get a B or an A. It'll be impossible to get an A. Now, if you want to challenge me and go, oh yeah, I want to have at it. <laughs> go right ahead. Okay. Um, if you don't follow these guidelines, I'll talk to you. If you keep it up, I'll send an email to you. Uh, the student disciplinary people and they'll send the Nazis after you. Um, failure to complete any assignment other than daily quizzes will result in failure for the course. Well, there's only two other assignments and they're, quit they're exams. But I have had a student who thought I could skip the Tolkien exam. I don't like Tolkien. I don't want to write about Tolkien. Go ahead. <laughs> Makes my life a little bit easier. That's just one exam fewer for me to grade. Okay, um, but you will automatically fail the course. Automatically, that's an English department policy. If you fail to do a major assignment, it's automatic failure for the course. Okay. What else? Um, if you're not present when a quiz has begun, you just get a zero for that quiz. Okay, and there'll be. Oh, I don't know. How many quizzes there will be? I'd say at least 10. Fellowship of the Rings, of the Ring, Two Towers, Return of the King, one for each Harry Potter book. Possibly more than that. Uh, we only meet 14 weeks. You won't have one for today. Possible there can be a quiz on Thursday over either the assigned reading for Thursday, or, and, or, what we talked about today, not the syllabus. I'm not going to go, oh, what did I say in paragraph three? <laughs> Won't be anything like that. What is the punishment for wearing headphones like gloves? Yeah. <laughs> Won't be that, okay? Um, depending on how many quizzes there are, I might drop the lowest two, or lowest one or two, okay? Might is the operative word there. Um, course grade is real easy to calculate. You'll have a total number of quizzes. You'll have two exams. Exams will be 100 points each. Quizzes will be, I don't know, somewhere between 100 and maybe a total 120 points. So 300 to 320 points. However many points you earn, let's say you get all the extra credit on the quizzes, and there will be extra credit on almost every quiz. Say you end up with 300 and 40 points. Well, you have a pretty high A there, okay? Let's say you end up with 140 points. You're kind of barely scraping the F. I mean, that would be below 100, uh, below 50%, okay? Um, what else? No makeup quizzes will be given. Anyone caught cheating or plagiarizing? Going to be hard to do. With this exception, quizzes... You might want to pretend like you're a horse with blinders and keep your eyes here. Why? You don't want to take an answer from somebody else that is not only wrong, but is spectacularly wrong. Because if two people have the same spectacularly wrong answer, that's pretty much a dead giveaway. One of them was cheating. It's impossible for me to know which one. So usually what I'll do is I'll take both of you outside and say, one of you is cheating. You beat up each other out here to figure out, you know, who, et cetera. Because that's the only warning you get. The next time it happens, it goes off to judicial affairs. Okay. Um, the rest of that I think we can skip. So, schedule. I have on fairy stories, even though you weren't able to read it because I forgot to send you the link. Um, and you probably wouldn't have read it overnight anyways, because it's about 65 pages long. And some of it's really dense, okay? But we'll talk a little bit about that today and what more time we have. Well, we've got about 40 minutes. Um, 
and we might talk about it some on Thursday. If we do talk about it some on Thursday, then we automatically get behind. Because when I say some, that probably means most of the period. Um, so we'll see what happens. So three days, essentially, two and a half days for Fellowship of the Ring. Anybody know how long Fellowship of the Ring is? About 400 pages. Two and a half days for Two Towers. A little bit shorter. Two and a half days for Return of the King. It's shorter yet. Unless you read the appendices, in which case it's longer than the other two. Okay? We won't talk about the appendices. Unless you want to. I mean, if we got some Tolkien nerds in here, we can go there. I don't recommend we do. Um, then on the 18th of February, I'll hand out the Tolkien exam topics. It's a take home. And you'll have anywhere from three to six topics. Choose one. Okay? And I'll talk about what the exam um, requirements are a little bit later because I, I have them right here in the syllabus. Okay? And then we'll start Philosopher's Stone slash Sorcerer's Stone. I will refer to it by its British title. Why? Because it makes sense. The American title is for idiots. And that's because the American editor thought Americans were idiots. He actually told J.K. Rowling, no parent in America is going to buy a book for their child that has the word philosopher in the title. And in doing so, he created another big can of worms, okay, which we'll talk about. So, um, a day, day and a half for Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, day, day and a half for Chamber of Secrets, and if we get behind with Lord of the Rings, we might compress that even a little bit more. Why? Because Philosopher's Stone is only really important when you get to about the last three chapters. Everything else in that is just kind of setting up the universe and setting up the story, which we can cover very, very quickly. But the last three chapters, oh, that takes a lot of unpacking. Okay? Same kind of with Chamber of Secrets. Right? The Prisoner of Azkaban, day and a half. Again, she's still creating the world. She's still setting up some of the parameters of the universe. And it's really, there it gets a little bit more. It's more like the last half dozen chapters that are really important. And then we get Goblet of Fire, where it's sink or swim. Why? Because Goblet of Fire is not like the previous three books. Did any of you grow up reading these? Yeah. Okay, about a half dozen. I used to teach a, a course in London, um, The Appeal of Harry Potter. And the first one I taught was in 2003. And by that point, the first four books were out. And everybody then had kind of grown up, uh, to some extent at least, reading Because there were a lot of 18-year-olds, and they were like, yeah, I was 12 when I first started reading this, and I can't wait, because every time I teach the course, a new book would come out. Or a film, okay? Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more as we get into it. Then we have Spring Break, so we have Goblet of Fire, three and a half days. If we're not behind already, that's when we'll start getting behind, okay? Goblet of Fire is significantly longer than each of the first three books, and it's just denser. It's denser, it's darker, it's thematically more difficult, okay? And then we'll have to take steroids because that's what J.K. Rowling did when she wrote The Order of the Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> Why is The Order of the Phoenix so long? It's like 878 pages, I think, in the American edition. The British edition is only 600 some pages. Why? The words are closer together, literally. Words are closer together, there's less white space on a page. Okay? Americans are stupid, remember? So we have to have more white space, more more room, etc. But why is it so much longer? How many words? Harry's angst. Harry's angst, okay. <laughs> sure. What else? Well, beginning with Goblet of Fire, what did we begin seeing happen in culture? What did bookstores start doing? Release parties. Oh. There weren't release parties for the first three books. When the, when the fourth book came out, it was the first time in history 
that you could order a book and have it on the New York Times bestseller list before anybody could even read it. When the fourth book came out, it was number when it when people could actually first begin to read it, it was number one on the New York Times bestseller list. In two, three, and four, were Harry Potter and the Philosopher, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Top four books. After number four, New York Times changed their bestseller list criteria. They created a new criteria. Bestseller children's list because the intellectuals at the New York Times didn't think a children's book should be the number one book above serious adult you know realistic fiction that says life sucks and then you die you know, <laughs> right? so when five six and seven came out they were number one on the children's list right? anyways three Days for Goblets of Fire, for Goblet of Fire essentially, and then four days, three and a half days, for Order of the Phoenix, we'll be behind. Half Blood Prince, three days, and then Deathly Hallows, I think I have four days. Why? Because Deathly Hallows, she does all the tying up of loose ends, and there are a lot of loose ends, okay? For those of you who are rolling fanatics, if there are some of you who are, um, let me apologize now because I'm going to pop some balloons. Mm -hmm. Rolling is not. How do I want to put this? The author died long ago. No. Um, in my course evals from last fall, I had one student. I'm pretty sure I know who it was. <laughs> had one student say, you know, Sherman needs to become more politically correct. He's a misogynist. He's alt right. He's homophobic. He's racist, sexist, all this kind of stuff. And I think it was largely because I point out that in the Harry Potter novels, at least, rolling leaves all kinds of errors. I mean, just out, in, I don't mean errors, this is my opinion. I mean, for example, in one book, we find out that there's a person who is six feet away from something. Okay? And that person doesn't move because that person dies. Falls to the ground, we're told. And we're told, still six feet away. About a paragraph and a half later, we're told now that that person is 20 feet away. What? It was six feet away. How are you now 20 feet away? What happened? Dead people don't move, not even Harry Potter. Unless you get in a period, you know, somebody turns you into a zombie. That didn't happen. So what happened? Okay, well, that's Goblet of Fire. What does Bloomsbury, British publisher, scholastic American publisher, now know about every word J.K. Rowling puts on a page? Cash registers, you know, just rolling, man. I think by that point, her copy editor said, I'm not touching it. Because the fourth book and the fifth book, they've got a bunch of errors. And I think the copy editor just, I think probably the senior editor said, don't change a thing. Because we're just raking in the money here. Right? I mean, after all, she went from being penniless to, from the time the first book was published to the time the last book was published, to being a billionaire. She went from being poor and on Scottish version of welfare, to being the wealthiest woman in the United Kingdom. Wealthier than Queen Elizabeth. Because of words on a page. Okay? So you don't want to touch those words. Um, and then we'll have, at the end, where is it? Uh, the rolling exam will be given out on April 28th. And it'll be due, I think that's a Monday, okay? It's not the regular exam time that's listed, okay? But it'll be due, uh, the 28th is a Tuesday, so the following, you know, six days later, uh, due via email if you don't want it returned. If you want it returned, 
you bring it to me in my office or put it in a box on my door, I'll be in there. Um, Etc. Okay? Same kind of form. You'll have somewhere between three and six topics. Choose one and write your best. Okay? Question. Yes? Um, when you say we have like three days for such and such book, how much like external reading? None. None? None. For, for these exams, you don't have to do any library research or anything like that. Okay? In fact, I don't want you to. I want to know your thoughts, your response. I don't care what other people say. I want to think, to hear what you say about whatever the topics are that I give you. And maybe with the slight exception of one topic, okay, that you'll get on the final exam. None of these are stroke my ego topics. My ego, not yours. <clears throat> um, they're all, you know, about something, some aspect of the book or books, okay? For example, look right here. So here's the form the exams will take. You're going to write a 750 to 1,000 word exam. Roughly three full pages, okay? Three full pages is right kind of in the middle. It's about 900 words, okay? On the J.R. Tolkien material and another one on the rolling material. Okay, choice among several topics. You'll follow the directions that will be included in the handout, but those, in direction, those directions will include these exact same directions right here. Okay, because I will copy and paste them. So, for the Tolkien exam, you must have five direct, substantive, 10 to 30 word, quotations, not paraphrases or summaries, but direct quotations from the Lord of the Rings. And I think the way, the only way I change that on the exam sheet is I will say, I want one quotation from the Fellowship of the Ring, one from the Two Towers, one from Return of the King, and you choose where you get the other two from. Okay? Why do I do that? Because I've had a smart ass student in the past take all five quotations from one page. Okay. And tried to, you know, with that one page, tried to argue something that you really needed to quote from all three books. Okay, question. So, um, how, uh, do, you, do you care how if we go a little bit over the thousand words? Yeah, if it's depending on how you define a little bit. Okay. <laughs> if you're 1,100 words, that'll probably be fine. If you're 1,500 words, that's not a little bit. That's one and a half times the length. Okay, 20 students. That adds significant amount of grading time. And I'll tell you in a moment how I go about grading, okay? Put a little fear in you. Um, so, notice these are direct quotations, not paraphrases or summaries. Does it mean you can't paraphrase? No, you can paraphrase, you can summarize. But you better have five direct quotations. Yes? Are we going to be able to take any of them from... The fairy stories and all? Yes, I think one or two of the questions will involve stuff from the fairy story essay. Okay? In fact, I know one of them will, depending on how much we get to talk about the fairy story essay. Think about it. Not, it will, just automatically. Okay? Notice how I define substantive 10 to 30 words. Why? I had to add this, I don't know, somewhere in the last couple of years. Because I would have somebody quote the word, yes. <laughs> it's a quotation. It's in the book. Go to the page. How the heck did they spin that? Because they like thought I was know. stupid. And I'll usually, how stupid do you think I am, you know, is what I will write. Um, anyways, don't do that. Um, okay. So, for the Harry Potter novels, notice... You will have direct substantive 10 to 30 words, quotations, not paraphrases or summaries, but direct quotations from at least five different Harry Potter novels. Not four, three, <laughs> not four, not two, not one. Does that mean you can't have six? No, you can have six quotations, but they better be from five different Harry Potter novels. 
right? And then you have all this kind of stuff about format, all that stuff on the bottom about what kind of papers we'll get, what kinds of grades, okay? Well, notice right here, failure to include a title for your paper, failure to turn in your paper on the assigned date, and or failure to follow any of these directions will result in an automatic F on the paper. Now, some of that I'm just trying to scare the hell out of you. I'll tell you which parts so that it's very clear. Um, formatting. If you don't, if you've got a justified right margin, I'm not going to go moron. Yes, no. <laughs> but I will put a comment there about the margins. Okay? Why? That's me. That's because unjustified, non-proportional spacing is easier to read. It's easier on the eyes. It's easier on the brain. I can show you the studies. Okay? Um, paper link, eh, that's pretty important. You don't want to fudge on that one. So don't turn in a paper with, as I had them last fall, uh, 150 words. It's, it's the beginning. Even all the quotes. Yeah, they didn't have them. <laughs> okay, didn't have them. And, and I was just like, <clears throat> WTF. <laughs> um, number of required sources, etc. So here's what I'll do when I get your papers. Because I'm anal, I'll put them in alphabetical order. I won't hand them back that way, by the way. I'll shuffle them up. Um, I'll put them in alphabetical order, and I just go like this. Title, put it over here, title, put it over here. And if there's not a title, I give you one. It's a big fat F. I put it over here. I don't read it. I will not read it. Why? If you didn't take the time to put a freaking title on it, I'm not going to take the time to read it. Okay? That's the first mark. <laughs> That's the first, first run through. Second run through, I turn to the back. Does it have a works cited page? And if it doesn't, it's an F. What's, what's going to be your work cited for Lord of the Rings? Lord of the Rings! You have one! It's not that hard! And at some point in the semester, I will probably write on the board what it should look like. It's, this isn't rocket science. Okay? If you can't do the minimum, I hate to say it, you shouldn't be here. College isn't for everybody. That's not a slam on anybody. I am a real strong proponent of hard work. And I don't mean hard, uh, manual. I mean the trades, skilled craftsmanship. I'm a woodworker. I mean, like 90% of me wishes I'd done that. And probably 90% of you in a couple weeks will wish. <laughs> Sherman, you should have done that. You missed your calling. Okay? So, work site. If it's not there, you get an F. Okay? Then what do I do? Those that so far have the title, have the work cited. I then go through and I look for quotations. And if it's Lord of the Rings, I'll find one, I'll put a one. I find another one, two, another one, three. And I make sure there's five. If there's not five, it's an F. Would it help if we put like a list of all of our quotations? Nope. Like the bottom? No, okay. No, because you could lie. <laughs> if I take that as you know the truth, it, it could be wrong. Why? Students have done that before. They've listed quotations, and I've got, hmm, this is an MLA style, and then I start looking for them. And like I've had happen, half of them weren't there. They meant to, oh, and don't do this either. Don't have a, a, a little tag in your paper as you're writing it for you to say, put good rolling quote here, and leave it. <laughs> I, I had that happen last fall. A couple different classes. That just makes me feel bad. And it, and it just it didn't get put there. That's what happens when you're writing a paper. Let's see, this class meets at 940 at 820. <laughs> and you've been up all night. Okay. Um, so I go through and count the quotations. Are there five from the Lord of the Rings? Is there one for each of Fellowship, Two Towers, Return of the King? Harry Potter. There might be five quotations. They might be from only four books. F. 90% of success in life is following simple directions for anybody, okay? I, I, I'm not trying to treat you like high schoolers or whatever, but the only reason I've had to come up with this 
is because of previous iterations of the class. People just not doing what was needed or um, expected. Okay? Um, and then there's, you know, spelling. It should go without, without saying, right? The main hero of J.K. Rowling's books. How do you spell his name? Not H-A-R-Y. I've seen it. I've seen the character of Gandalf, who is based upon Norse mythology, changed into Gandalf. That's Italian. Okay. I've seen Frodo change to Fredo. <laughs> He just became Italian, you know, and there is no Italian in Middle Earth, okay? So, when you write about a character, at least spell the character's name right. It's Rolling, by the way. It's not Rollings. There's no S on the end, okay? Tolkien, I can understand. It's weird spelling, but he uses it consistently. The books use it consistently on it. The syllabus uses it consistently. Middle Earth is M-I-D-D-L-E hyphen, small e, A-R-T-H, okay? Don't go by what you might see in journalists, newspaper art, because they're morons. They all get it wrong, okay? Christopher Tolkien died the other day. I read an article, I think it was from The Guardian or something like that, you know, supposedly highbrow literary and stuff, stuff in England. They had cap middle, cap earth, no hyphen, all throughout. Okay, simple copy editor should have cut that because that's one of the things Tolkien repeatedly had to change when it came back from typesetters and such. Pedantic? Yes, it's pedantic. Any great meaning in terms of the overall meaning of life? No. But it's the little details that catch an awful lot of um, what's important, let's say, in reality. Okay, any questions about this? Oh, and then I do give... Okay, you don't have to pay any attention to the paraphrase because you're not going to be doing paraphrasing. Um, what sample of your what your first paper, first page should look like? Okay. Notice Smith one. It's upper right hand column. Your last name, page number, and then assuming your name is John Smith, put this. But notice I put but use your name. Anybody know where I'm going? <laughs> I had a student last fall turn in a paper with my name because I put Ted Sherman there, and they put Ted Sherman. I've had students before put, because I've had your name, they put your name. <laughs> Does that leave some right name in the page at the top? Like... The one that had my name did. <laughs> yeah, took me a few minutes. Anyways, you've got all this stuff here, Pity and Mercy and Lord of the Rings, this is where your paragraph begins. Please do not put, this is where your paragraph begins. Because <laughs> I did have another paper. I used to just put here, blah, blah, blah. I had a paper that began, blah, blah, blah. And then they just, went they just went on into their paper. And I'm like, oh my God, I've been teaching too long. <laughs> okay. Any questions about the syllabus? About course expectations? Does it matter what version of the Harry Book you get, or? No. Okay. No, I mean, the one I signed for the, I had the textbook order for the class is the boxed edition, just in case you want to have it in the little paper back box like thing. Uh, if you're like me at all, and if you dog ear your pages at all, if you dog ear like two of the books, it won't fit in there anymore because the dog ear and page doubles the width of the page. You do that with a couple books, it's really tight to get the seven books in the box as it is. My son got me a new copy a couple of years ago for Christmas because, you know, the six copies I already have that are all marked up aren't enough. How much of the books are we actually reading? Are we reading all of the them. whole yes. thing? Yes. Okay. Wow. Yep. One of the comments from one of my classes last fall was, don't read this if you don't like, don't take this course if you don't want to read. Or, don't take this course if you can't read <clears throat> 400 pages a week, essentially. Because that's it's about what it comes out to. I mean, there's 10 novels, right? If you take The Lord of the Rings as being three, it's not. It's not a trilogy. 
A trilogy is three separate novels about a common idea or character. The Lord of the Rings is one really, really long book. It's only divided into three because Tolkien's original publisher said, are you crazy? We can't publish a 1,200-page book. I think, well, look at the one you have. Nobody published books like that. I mean, Dostoevsky, but he was Russian. They're idiots. I mean, they don't publish these massive books. His publisher wouldn't do that. Right? Um, so it's three novels divided in, it's one novel divided into three volumes. It's actually one novel divided into six volumes. You've got book one, book two, book three, book four, book five, book six. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, we're going to read all of them. Okay. Now, does that mean we're going to skip passages in class? Yes, obviously. Um, we'll probably let me put this up. Twenty minutes to not do much. So, are um, you expecting us like you're going to tell us what how far we need to get in the book when we get ready for like the next class? Or yeah, well, I mean, if you look at, for example, at the syllabus, I've got roughly four Fellowship of the Ring, two and a half days. So, I would suggest half a book a day. So for Thursday, <laughs> right, blow your mind, half of Fellowship of the Ring. How many of you have read Lord of the Rings before? Only four of you, okay? How many of you have seen the films? Another six or seven. How many of you don't give a rat you know what for J.R.R. Tolkien? Come on, be honest, show your hands because the rest of you don't, okay? So most of you haven't read the Lord of the Rings. Some of you have read the Lord of the Rings and seen the film. Some of you have seen the films. I said earlier, you can't go by what the films show. Why? Because they're films, first of all. They're not the novels. And Tolkien says in one place, the way to really get, the way to really understand what a work means, it's, it's in the details. It's in the atmosphere of the work. That's all of the stuff that Tolkien is particularly known for. The descriptive language. Some of you are going to absolutely hate it. Maybe most of you. Why? Because Tolkien likes description. No other way of saying it. He's going to describe something so that it's going to be so clear that his that image will be very, very concrete. With some exception. There are some things he doesn't want to be very, very concrete. He wants you to kind of wonder about them. Okay? J.K. Rowling will not do that nearly as much. Why? She's a different kind of author. Okay? Tolkien was fascinated by, was moved by, the kind of literature that has now been dead for a thousand years that is very descriptive. Old English poetry, Germanic poetry and prose, Welsh poetry and prose. Tolkien can read like 14 different languages. Greek, Latin, French, German, Spanish, Italian, Sanskrit, Hebrew. He translated the book of Job, I think it was. Job or Jonah for the Hebrew, uh, for the Jerusalem Bible. Okay. Um, and a bunch of other dead languages. Gothic, Old Norse, Finnish. Okay. Um, all that stuff that he read and appreciated just kind of cooks in his mind and gets produced to us as uh, the Lord of the Rings, okay? Now we have about 17 minutes. So, yeah, we will be behind on Thursday. Definitely. Tolkien's essay on fairy stories, which he delivered in 1938-39. I can never remember the exact date. Um... If you take the time to read that, it's about, as I said, 65 pages. If you read it, you don't need to read the notes that, that are at the end. They're, those are, I don't know, 8 to 10 pages. But if you take the time to read on fairy stories, 
you will have given you the kind of key to understand everything he is doing in the Lord of the Rings and in the Hobbit. Okay, um, and and I would argue, and I, I argue this in my other classes, even in all of his scholarly critical work, Tolkien was a was an expert on the Old English heroic poem Beowulf. He was at the time when he was writing the Lord of the Rings. He was regarded as as one of the, if not the most knowledgeable person about that poem. He knew it inside and out. A couple of years ago, his son came out with Tolkien's translation of Beowulf. It's not a very good translation. I would argue, I teach, I used to teach Old English and Beowulf at the graduate level. So fall semester, students learn Old English and they read a few poems and some prose stuff. In the spring semester, they translate. You read all of Beowulf, 3,182 lines in Old English and translate it into modern English, as well as reading a bunch of articles and things like that about it. Okay? Tolkien's translation of Beowulf is very archaic. That is, he uses old-fashioned language, the kind of old-fashioned language that he uses in The Lord of the Rings. Now, The Lord of the Rings was written in the 1940s and 50s, late 30s, 40s and 50s. He doesn't use the kind of language that everybody uses in the late 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Just look at Tolkien and look at William Faulkner. Faulkner's writing in the 1940s. Look at Flannery O'Connor. She's writing in the 1940s. Look at some other British authors, Evelyn Waugh and such. They're writing in that same time. But Tolkien sounds like some guy who's been brought out of the grave. Why? It's the language and the mentality that the language expresses that he likes personally. Right. So, Lord of the Rings, you can date from roughly about 1937 to 1954. 1954 is when it begins. Okay? On fairy stories, roughly 38, 39, he's writing it at least in 38. The Hobbit, have you seen The Hobbit? Or to wash your mind out afterwards because it's <laughs> he published that in 1937. It's because of that that he was asked to deliver this lecture. Because this thing was immediately, I mean, on publication, regarded as a modern classic, an immediate classic. Notice the paradox there. If it's immediate, it can't be classic. Classic means it stood the test of time. If I publish it today, it's not a classic tomorrow, because it hasn't passed enough time. This was hailed as that, right? So he was asked to deliver this lecture. He wasn't the first one asked. There were like two other guys before, but they kind of, yeah, let's see, okay, right? So he's asked to deliver this essay, and he titles it on fairy stories. He's delivering it at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, and he's delivering it, delivering it as the Andrew Lang Society Lecture. Andrew Lang was a guy in the late 19th century, very early 20th century, who wrote a series of books of fairy tales. That is, he didn't write the fairy tales, he compiled them. And it's called the Rainbow Series, because each one has a different color. Okay? So he kind of starts this, this modern study of fairy stories as having significance. Okay? So Tolkien, in this essay, begins by saying there are three main questions that anybody proposing to talk about fairy stories has got to talk about. One, what are they? What's a fairy story? And again, fairy story is synonymous with fantasy. Okay? Two, what are their origins? When did fairy stories begin? Okay. And three, what is their use and function now? Now notice that third question that's kind of interesting. Because of the two things that he says there, use and function. How do you use a story? How do you use Stephen King's The Stand? 
can use it as a paperweight. You can use it to hold the door open. It's so heavy. How do you use literature? How do you use Star Wars? Star Wars is literature of a sort. It's literature translated to film. Okay? But how do you use it? To escape reality. To escape reality. That's one use. Learn from it. That's one thing Tolkien's going to talk about. Learn from it. What are you going to learn from the stand? Don't trust men in black. <laughs> well, while it, you obviously, you know, the literal is there, but I think the more important thing is the, the moral themes and purpose of behind book of writing and what path goes on. Okay, let's use Star Wars. I love using Star Wars because it fits so beautifully. First film, the real first film, 1977. Okay? What's the moral message, so to speak, that comes out? Where is it expressed, or is it expressed, in the film? There is one scene that kind of expresses it. Luke is on um, Han Solo's ship, Millennium Falcon. He's with Obi-Wan, and he's starting his Jedi training. And Han Solo's sitting back there, you know, polishing his blaster, you know, so to speak. And Luke's trying to, you know, defeat the blaster thing that's whizzing around his head. And Obi-Wan puts the blast shield on. He's like, but I can't see it. He says, that's the point. You need to reach out with the Force, Luke. What does Han Solo say? Anybody remember? Like Hokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good Uzi, you know, a good AK-47, because I don't take care of them all. That's when Obi-Wan puts the blast shield down, and he's like, reach out with the force. And Luke gets zapped a couple times, but then he does a v -v -v. And also, I was like, lucky kid, lucky. Well, you kind of have a message there. What's the message? Trust in hokey religions? What enables Luke to destroy the Death Star at the end? It's the connection with the force. It's not. the It helps. Millennium Falcon helps, right? He gets rid of Darth Vader. Without that, Luke's a goner. Okay. But it's so so translate that. Is George Lucas really wanting all of us to become Jedi? There are some crazy people who think that. There is a Jedi religion, at least in the U I was gonna say USSR. In Russia, there is no USSR anymore. I don't know how much there is in the United States. Is he really saying to do that? No. What is he saying? Faith. Louder. Faith. Faith. He's saying the same kind of thing Hamlet tells his friend Horatio. In Hamlet, there is more in heaven and earth than is dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. In other words, there's more than just what we see. Okay? Well, Tolkien kind of gets at that. So, what are they? Tolkien says, you can't define them. You cannot define a fairy story. Why? What does that word define mean? Yes? So what do you mean, like, what are they? You keep saying fairy story. Like... Singular or plural. Yeah. What is a fairy story? So not what is a fairy. What is a fairy story? Exactly. What is a fairy story? Because Tolkien begins with this. And he says, well, let's do the OED. Let's do what every undergraduate does. Let's look it up. And he says, well, what does the OED say? Oxford English Dictionary. It's a story about fairies. Well, what's a fairy? And there's another question. You know, what is a fairy? How do you define a fairy? How do you know a fairy when you see one? Have you ever seen a fairy? Okay. Well, the OED says it's a story about fairies. And Tolkien says, no, it's not. There are a lot of fairy stories that don't have any fairies in them. So he finally says, you cannot define it. Because right? define means what? Put a limit around. But he says, what essentially, I think it was Justice Potter Stewart. My son corrected me a few months ago. He's a law student. Justice Potter Stewart, when a, an obscenity case came before the Supreme Court, a pornography case, he said, we cannot define what it is, but I know it when I see it. Tolkien says, I know a fairy story when I read one. 
but I can't define it. Why? Because defining it then says, oh, well, everybody can write a fairy story. Because if you define it, what are you saying? It has specifically these qualities. So give me an example of a fairy story. Anybody. Come on. Any fairy story. Like Snow White? Snow White's a fairy story. Where are the fairies? Sizest or something. <laughs> okay. Cinderella? Mm -hmm. It has fairies. Though. Does it have fairies? It has a fairy, fairy godmother. It has a fairy godmother. Snow White doesn't, though. Though Snow White does have. Yeah, precious cake. As the witch. Well, Is that a negative fairy godmother? I mean, we, okay. Not all of them have fairies, per se. Hansel and Gretel. Has a witch, doesn't have fairies. Um, Little Red Riding Hood, no witch, no fairies. Big bad wolf, you know. So what's the quality? Tolkien says that essentially he has this quality of the perilous realm about them. That is, you enter a space where you never know what's going to happen. Where anything can happen. Okay? Is Doctor Strange a fairy story? If you've seen the film? I, I've been in New York. I don't know about you, but if I was walking down Fifth Avenue in New York, and Fifth Avenue suddenly went like this, and everything else started MC Escherin out, you know, I'd go, I'm not in Kansas anymore, Toto, you know. <laughs> That would t totally blow the mind, right? right? I imagine you could say Alice in Wonderland is a fairy story. Alice in Wonderland is a fairy story. And he will refer to Lewis Carroll quite a bit. Okay. Have you ever seen the movie Inception? Would yes. that technically be a fairy story thing? Because you dive into someone's mind and recreate and change the whole mind? Yeah, I think so, possibly. Okay. 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 See, what does both Inception, what does Doctor Strange not emphasize? As opposed to, say, Iron Man. Reality. Science, reality. What do you mean by science? Uh, I mean, there's nothing technical about it. What makes Iron Man Iron Man? Engineering. Engineering. He has an iron suit. What does, after all, in one of the Avengers movies, what does Cap say to Tony? Big man what, in a suit of armor. Big man in a suit of armor. Take the suit of armor and what do you have? Billionaire, you know, philanthropist, playboy, Tony smarts off. Is it the suit that made Cap Cap? No, but it is what? Science. <laughs> is that really what makes Cap Cap, though? No. What is it makes Cap Cap? I can do this all day. And get the snot beat out. It's the courage. It's the, it's the willingness to stand up for the little guy. When he is the little guy, you know? Okay. Tony only has that win. When he got the suit on, you know. Otherwise, it's run away, run away. Okay. Um, origins. Culkin says you can't talk about origins because what are you really getting at? What's the origin of story? What do every stories center around? Every one. What's their basic common ingredient? Close. You used a word that kind of got to what I want to pull out. Close. Words. Words. Every one. Can I communicate a story to you without words? Yeah. I mean, other than visual, other than drawing. No, I can't. Because in order for my idea up here to get to your brain, what's got to happen? You have to write or draw it. I've got to get it out from up here. Some kind of communication. Okay. Have you read a lot of stories visually, solely by image? There are a lot of stories that are solely told by images. A lot? Yeah. I think there's some graphic novels. 
But what do all graphic novels have? Words. Okay, see, I'm not familiar with any that don't have any words. That don't have any balloons, uh, balloons, balloons, you know, with with text in them. Now, I do know of some novels because I've got a couple at home um, that are solely images. Yeah. Uh, Hugh, uh, Hugh Cabray, something like that, and then there's. This other one. Because um, we used to, quote unquote, read them to our kids. We'd look at the pictures, and then my wife and I would make stuff up about what the pictures are saying. Is that what the author, draw, or, I don't know, illustrator, I don't know. Right? But Tolkien essentially says when you're talking about the origins of stories, what are you really talking about? The origins of language, the origins of myth. Can't talk about the origins of myth. What is myth? What does myth mean? The word myth comes from the Greek meaning for the Greek word for meaning. Poesis, from which we get poem, means to make. So mythopoeic means myth making, story making, meaning making. That's what myths do. They attempt to give meaning. So when there's all kinds of lightning and thunder. Ooh, there's somebody doing what? Throwing lightning bolts, and that's how we get Zeus, right? Or Thor, you know. So Tolkien finally gets down to this question. He goes, this is the important question. Why? Because J.K. Rowling did not invent something that conferred invisibility. The invisibility cloak. Neither did J.R.R. Tolkien with the ring. Long before J.R.R. Tolkien, there was the ring of the Nibelungs, the Nibelungen lead, roughly 1204, written in Middle High German. And it's a ring that makes you invisible. And before that, there was the ancient Greeks. I'm trying to remember what specifically it was, and I'm drawing a blank. But there was something that if you took, it would give you invisibility. What about the first, the first Harry Potter novel? Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. She doesn't create. That's why I think we ought to use that title. Why? The idea of the Philosopher's Stone goes back at least 3,000 years. The idea of a Sorcerer's Stone goes back to 1997. <laughs> it was invented by an American publisher. Okay? And guess what? There are still people honestly, sincerely, intentionally seeking the Philosopher's Stone today. I didn't believe that. Because of what they think it can confer. Okay? And we'll talk about what that is uh, later. Okay, we'll stop. Because we're a minute over. Um, Okay, how am I going to... Um, try to read about the first four or five chapters. Now, take that back. For Lord of the Rings, get to... That's the first half of the book. Uh, if you can read the first half, get through the first half. If not... Definitely get through all of the second chapter, or um, get to get through the prancing pony. Get through the prancing pony chapter. Can't tell you what it is because I don't have the book. And if you read the Tolkien essay on fairy stories, I'll post it in about an hour. <laughs>